and welcome to the 99th edition of Keen Minds podcast. We cover NBC's The Blacklist. This is season 7, episode 15, Gordon Kemp. I am Jen, aka Takata Saigo. And I am Tessa. And it was a episode that um yeah, that one sparked controversy, and it had at the same time very interesting things. It, I will say, and Tessa and I were discussing this before we started recording, um, I definitely had to, I, as many of you know, I, I am a Texas native, um, and, you know, I personally... The girl likes her, her, her god. I am a big fan, especially as a petite female of... If you are well trained and go through the appropriate steps of being able to conceal carry and be able to carry for protection, big fan of it. Texas native, it happens. Um, so I definitely, when I watched this episode, I made a conscious effort on the rewatch to take a step back, take myself out of my own head, and really watch it to see if there was. Something beyond just the kickstart reaction to the the subject matter, why I felt off about this episode. Um, and overall, I, I liked it a lot better in the rewatch just because I found a lot more when I did that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that one of the key things that really bothered me about this episode was that the blacklister was there wasn't a lot of depth to him tessa and i talk about quite a bit how blacklist is very good at creating villains with deep backgrounds that you can say okay i get where they're coming from you know they are the hero of their own story they may be killing a bunch of people you may not be okay with their methods but you go all right i get it Mm-hmm. This guy, it was just money. Well, it was like Vanessa Cruz. How can you not feel like, oh. in my view, Vanessa Cruz was a hero. You know, these guys were Vanessa. crooks. <laughs> these guys I, were crooks, and she was just making, taking care of the crooks. Oh, I love Vanessa Cruz. And I've got certain blacklisters that I adore. They, I mean, let them go. Let them do their thing. And But this guy, he just... There wasn't really... He was... A corporate CEO of a, you know, a, a, a the, all he wanted was to make a buck, and he grandstanded. It, when, when they were in the interrogation, and there was a line in there that I have in my notes, um, wrestlers talk about how he's part of the NRA, and he's, you know, a big fan of the Second Amendment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and he says... You know, but this has nothing to do with keeping a well-regulated militia and everything to do with making a buck. Kim's response is, and I make more of it with every shooting that goes viral. Not only am I not stopping, I'm ramping up production. In fact, I just ordered a shipment of 6,000 fine cows, I think is what they call them, Mm -hmm. from my factory in Atlanta to distribute in the center in Chicago. That was such, I mean, I I felt like I was watching a Bond villain twirl his mustache and deliver his grand well, plan that doesn't happen on the blacklist it was that when i, I mean, caught they, that they, they are the speakable ones i think that the problem is that when you get this speakable one in a hot in a hot bottom issue you get problems i think that that's what happens when you when you get a a a a one-sided bad villain which they have been quite a bit of them in in a hot bottom issue, I think that you end up with something that is not exactly the best of the deal. Yeah, and and I, I think that's probably the core of it that they had a you know and you know everybody has their opinions on the matter, um, and I believe thoroughly that writers are going to input pieces of themselves and their view their life views which they should i mean that's that's how they deepen the story but But i i just felt like this guy i mean because he was a horrible human being 
I mean, like, there was no question about it. No matter how you feel about the subject. There's been a number of them. I mean, just, just right. in, a, in, a, in, a, in a lineup of, and, and, and I feel that I have to present my issue because I am a liberal. But I am a liberal who happened to like guns. However, I like guns to be regulated. I mean, you need a license to drive a car. Well, like I said, I, I um, believe in training a person. If they're going to carry, you need to be trained. You need to you need to be a responsible individual. And you need Don't to just be like sure that, that, that somebody looks at that psyche of yours and decide that um, what are you going to use a gun for? Um, and, and so, I mean, that's a, it's a complex issue, but it's not that complex. The vast majority of of people would feel that there is a need for regulating something. It's not that just because you have a driver's license, that doesn't, that, that doesn't make you able to buy a tank and drive it in the town or, you know, in the highway. You don't see many, many tanks in, in, in the highway. And um, so there is a limit to what you can do. I mean, you can carry a certain kind of knives depending on each location to have the rules, but you certainly cannot go around the city with a machete. That's for sure. Uh, and hunting knives are also usually kept for hunting. So there is, there is a, there is a, a, a an, it's, it's an issue that is, that is a hot button. But it, I think that in this case, you're right. It was compounded by a, by a body that was so utterly boring. And I'll tell you why it was unimportant for this episode. I think that it could have been made a bit more interesting. But the pro, this episode wasn't really about Gordon Kemp, like many of the blacklisters, um, there's some that are puzzling. For example, we have two episodes after um, uh, what is the name Sonia Bloom that became Adrian Shaw. We have two, and she's really only the blacklister of the second part. She's not the blacklister of the first one, and that should have been named the coroner. Because that's a guy they were going for in order to get the identity. Um, for that matter, it could have been gone Gisa Barrera and she would have been a better for blacklister for that episode. But the reason is that the numbers tell a story. And in order to tell the story, you got to remain with the numbers that you need to tell the story. Um, they're, the story are numbers, and each number tells you a phrase, and that phrase constitutes a story. So in order to get the story, you need the blacklister that you need. Some, that's why you get sometimes blacklisters that are a tiny part of the episode. Gordon Kemp was nothing in this episode. He was just the minor character that appeared in a few scenes, said, you know, sure, change the narrative, insult the girl, shift responsibility from me. I'm okay with that. And then cried like a little girl when um, when uh, Reddington was was at the end of, of one of his own guns with Reddington. Or even when the mom slapped him. I just, yeah. I, like, I did love Cooper's response to that. I had some very mixed emotions over Cooper's wild ride of this episode. But his, you just get him out of here before someone does something worse. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yep. <laughs> Everybody wanted like to be me. that mother slapping him. Yeah. yeah. Like me, so I felt that you know, as a liberal who likes guns, I felt that I didn't precisely felt that that guy was like that. But on the other hand, I found that Reddington precisely um, voice what I feel about it. I have great yeah. respect for gun manufacturers that create weapons that can defend people that can be used for defense and hunting and all that, but. This kind of guns that end up, I mean, I live in, I live near New York. I know what, what they do in New York. They end up in the hands of the, of the criminals, like the twitchy little bastard that shot that girl when, that it was against all reason because what he should have done is leave. He had time to leave mm -hmm. and get there. Instead, he but had his probably pride. up on something. Yeah. He had his pride. He had to he had to shoot. He was a common street criminal that was never going to make it past age 20. And sure enough, he didn't. Um, you know, it was Reddington, but it could have been anybody else. 
so I felt that that Red said, you know, I admire this kind of people who do this kind of weapons that are used for the tools of my trade and the tools of the military and the tools of probably more high end criminals in which they're probably used more for intimidation than they're used for actual crimes. But the cheap guns end up in the hands of that thing that that had a lifetime of crime and it's going to just kill more members of their own communities and it's going to you know it's a drive-by shooting that kills a girl that was just sitting down doing her homework or the, the kid that was in the park yep and that's and what red, red said too many innocent people exactly and so the the people and this goes back to uh kate may when he was talking with you know the imagined katarina mm -hmm. you know have you ever killed someone who didn't deserve it no. And so in Red's mind, at least, whether that's true or not, in his mind, no one that he has killed has been an innocent. Mm -hmm. And so he he takes that very seriously. And I mean, that I really, really liked Red's uh, statement at the end. His, his appearing there and the statements that he made, it felt very much like the Mombasa cartel mm -hmm. when he showed up there and he was talking about Zembe and what he went through and why he's about to kill this guy. I can't remember his name, but... Gordon the, the guy, think, uh No, no, the, the guy from the Mombasa cartel. Oh, um... I can too. Um, Gif Pearl. Gif Pearl. Yeah, yep, that's it. Um, when, when he was telling Pearl that, you know... This is why, you know, th these are your sins and I'm about to execute, you know. I'm a bad on. man and you're a bad man and that's a good man, but I'm not a good man. Exactly. And that's exactly how I felt with that at the end. It was a really interesting journey that Red went on during this episode. Because another thing that kind of bothered me, but I think it was meant to feed this journey, was that he, he handed a case to the task force that they never should have taken. They didn't have legal standing for it. They didn't have enough to put it forward, which was really interesting because uh, Jonathan Shapiro, who was one of the writers on this, has a legal background. So it was really, I, I would love to pick his brain over that to see the reasoning behind that because I'm sure there was an intentional reason behind it. But there wasn't enough, inform or there wasn't enough evidence to really go after it. And Cooper made that comment. I yeah. love his comment at the beginning. He said, if you want my personal opinion, buy me a drink after work and we'll have a chat. But for what, as, as federal agents, they have to live up to a certain standard with this. And we saw that, that at several different, we saw it at several different points. Cooper said at the beginning, we had the judge that said it in the middle. And then at the end, when Cooper and Liz are talking about when you have that badge. Yeah. And so it was interesting, sorry, <laughs> short story long to get to the, to the point here. Watching Red hand that to them, try to take a semi-legal path, I guess, to, to do this that he felt very strongly about. Yeah. And at the they, end, you know, I, I felt went that back it was to at the end. Very natural. He yes. went back to something that's very natural. But I also don't feel like we had Red try to take that, but it's not necessarily him trying to take a better path because he still, it wasn't that he was handing them and said, okay, handle this in a legal fashion. He was saying, do it for me. You know, he was treating them like the FBI works for him. And he treated them in that moment like he does Chuck and I didn't Eddie feel it was like that. It was... Okay. I, I think it was it was that um, every once in a while, and, and we have discussed it. Uh, remember when I called that I said that wrestler would rubber band, mm -hmm. and he would just extend as far as he would go, and then he would snap back to his most um, tight person, and then back and forth. It there was a and and you could see how the writers did it intentionally. They would just stretch him, and then they would snap him back. And I think that this is this is taking us to something that we have said, and this is the theme of the rest of the season. And I've always recognized it. It, it seems like that's a moment that gets highlighted very much. And in this moment, it was it was Cooper's uh, conversation with Lisa at the end. It was we have blurred the limits 
in this and we don't no longer know what's our the line that we're crossing and not crossing and i think that is this is again where where you see and not just with 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 so with wrestler but this is now cooper and the rest of the task force red is stretching them to the point where they won't go they won't go anymore and then they snap back because here you have uh, even Aram, who's a being who in the past was such a supporter of Rennington, now going into well, I don't know this. He may just be taking out a competitor. We had Cooper uh, Cooper saying, you know, we have no legal standing. My personal opinions are mine, but in my job, I do this, and this is what happens. And I'm going to, and he even took steps to lay a trap for Red and Liz into making her believe that she was the one transporting the guns with all the time he wrestled with transporting them. I think that that feeds into a lot of what you've been saying, that you feel like Cooper knows a lot more than what he puts out there, that he's playing a, playing his own game on this mm-hmm. in a way. The, that That really, that moment where he got one over on Red... Yep. I, and I enjoyed that. I, I loved that moment for him. It was well done. Oh, so well done. And it's it shows that he he reads people and that he is able to step back enough out of his emotional attachment because he adores Liz. I mean, he was ready to officiate her wedding. He presided over her funeral. <laughs> I mean, again and again and again, he has, it's shown how close they are. And he made the comment at the end of this episode, he said, mm-hmm. it's been a terrible day. I just let a man with no moral compass go. But in the end, it's unbearable if you and I can't forgive each other. It wasn't that he was letting her go. It wasn't that he was just brushing off what she had done. He called her on it, but he was still willing to forgive as long as she was. And I thought that was very nice. Um, And it really, it was a very nice moment in their relationship. And it also highlighted that he's not a pushover. It's a reminder that he's an intelligence guy. He's... He plays at this level. This He got, a uh, wrestler said something very early on, I think it was season one. He said, you don't get to where I am if you're not good at this. And that's the same way with Cooper. He's the director of the FBI. Mm. He, run, he, he personally runs this task force. It's, you know, I mean, he doesn't get there without being incredibly good at what he does. And I think that that helped highlight that and bring it around because it's been easy lately to kind of forget that mm-hmm. with the way he's been approaching things. Well, and he is. He has played. He has played dumb a lot, and no. he plays dumb when he needs to play dumb. It was nice to understand that he, when he's playing dumb, he's just playing dumb. Yeah, exactly. Now, I have a question for you. Um, goes back to the rubber banding. Do you feel like this episode was a rubber banding moment within the same episode for Cooper? That that's the path that he was on? That he felt a certain way about it, he went too far, realized he went too far, and came back around and reset himself? No, I don't think it was for Cooper. I would think it was more for the others. I think Cooper did... Cooper, I think Cooper played well for both sides. He he took the case as Red wanted, and he used that case to create discomfort for a man he personally despised, create trouble, which is also a legal trouble, is a precedent, and then... Um, he actually was the one who gave Red the idea to get the shipment because he was already planning to do that. Red had not even noticed is after Cooper's call that Red decides to take the shipment. Cooper told him where the guns were going from A to B, from Atlanta to Chicago. No, and Liz then, had already told him. Because Red made that comment. He said, oh, yeah. no, Elizabeth's already filled me in. Yeah. He said, you're going to take the guns. And he had a plan on taking the guns. He I don't know take- about that. That's I- when he calls uh, he calls um, Hetty immediately after. Mm, I maybe. just went back and watched that. 
that entire thing of the transport of the guns was made by Cooper. Cooper told the other guy that they receive a threat before they had the threat. He created the threat. He used a play out of the of Red's playbook. He created the threat. He that he told Red, who hadn't who hadn't thought about it. Red then calls Hetty, arranges to take the guns, and Red, meanwhile Cooper was all the time planning on testing Liz. Uh, allegiance and this time the allegiance was very clear it was not to red even it was to what Liz believes Liz had fully gone into red's territory and remember that we had a conversation before with Cooper when she said I'm on the side of the truth that's not true either Liz is on the side of Liz yeah well I mean this reminded me so much of her therapist that she had that she let go and said you know someday I may need your help and it's we've seen this movement towards being more like red and obviously we've, we've seen the parallels to what red went through or at least what we think he's gone through and what liz is moving through and that i mean from the get-go he said you know i'm gonna teach you to think like a criminal i mean mm -hmm. he has been shaping her and training her since the pilot episode and and potentially before that, because he had his hand in various pieces of her education before. Mm -hmm. And so far, and, far, he was training her. And we have no idea if Tom was the first operative he had ever hired to keep an eye on her. Yeah, I mean, could have had someone in teenage years. Yeah, Who knows? It, to me, it is, it is, it was a very interesting episode, especially because it was supposed to be followed by Kuwait. That was your intention, was to air Kuwait. And Kuwait was a very interesting episode in which a lot of people saw it and said, oh, see, Cooper is an idiot. He doesn't know. He, he was hoodwink. He thinks Red was Reddington. Now he thinks Red is Ilya. And I'm like, I don't think so. I don't really think so. I think that, that Cooper is playing his own game. He knows what he knows, and he's just seeing how far this is going. Same as I don't really yeah. buy what that wrestler believes any of that, but I think that is he probably decided that the Rostov family is better kept at a distance. There are dangers, and they get into very strange things going on. Yeah. So something else that I found interesting, because as I mentioned in the last couple weeks, I'm doing a rewatch of the Blacklist right now, and I'm in the middle of season two. Uh, mm. Just got through just got through the Tom Keen episode. And um, so you have the whole trial there mm -hmm. and everything with Judge Jenner. And it's funny, I actually went back after doing my rewatch, we're recording this on Sunday. And so I did my rewatch on Saturday morning, which is my habit. And then I turned on the older episodes as I was doing other things during the day. And just in the background, it's going on and I hear Judge Dinner as he's talking, you know, Tom Connolly's come in and said, you're going to do this, you know, drop the case. And he comes out and the statement was, let me be, let me be clear, government secrecy, the idea of federal government can act, can surveil, can detail, can interrogate and even kill American citizens with no oversight or accountability, with no obligation to present people with the evidence that led to their actions. That, in my view, is the gravest threat to national security. It felt, I felt a certain thread in here of where Liz is taking things into her own hands. She is going on her own morality versus respecting and having a responsibility to the badge that she carries. She wants both. She wants to be able to act like Reddington does. And yet still have the badge and the backup that that badge brings. And it's just a very interesting thing that I never would have connected if I weren't doing this rewatch right now. But what is the, the question feels like, what is that responsibility and where can those lines be blurred? Like Cooper was talking about with the blurred lines. Mm -hmm. 
And it's it's very interesting. I you know Tessa and I have different opinions on where we think the show will end with her, and honestly, in the end, it's it's going to be what it's going to be, and we'll see. But she's going down a very Reddington style path right now, and where her own belief system is trumping everything else, and she's willing to use and abuse anything to get it there. Mm. Now, sometimes she'll be right, sometimes she'll be wrong. I mean, we've seen that with Red. And I loved Red's statements at the end. There is no jury. There's no law with me. I'm just the executioner. I, I execute my judgment. If I find you that you offend me, then that is, I just yeah. execute it. Yeah. Um, and I think that it goes to towards two things that have been running, there are themes that have been running throughout the show one of them is nature versus nurture it's Liz it's Liz more towards what she was that she had tried to be or is she really the person that she is the daughter of a you know basically a criminal or whatever Katerina you want to believe she's the daughter of I happen to believe is the blonde one um, they they were both criminals. They're they're cover. I mean, a, a covert agent, a spy, is basically doing all kind of illegal things, all some morally questionable things in the for the greater good of their own country. Um, some are. But they, I mean, then you have spies that work for. I mean, corporations I say, and yeah, Halcyon, Saint Regis. Yeah. I mean, we've yeah. had and, 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 co- and corporate espionage like Gina Zanitakos. Oh, he was Regis, just like. Yeah. In the Prophets or another one, or what was that British um, Olivia Olson? Mm-hmm. You know, they just there is a lot of of, of blacklisters that seemed, um, and you know, in a way, Olivia Olson reminded me very much of Gordon Kemp. They were they were both very flat, nothing to do with the actor. She was just very flat character. She's just bad. She's doing this. She's enjoying. She's making a lot of money. And she doesn't care one way or another the way she does. And I think that th- that, that is going into the other uh, the other narrative that is running through underneath all this, which is there is a place for the law and the badges and the way and the right and the wrong that is on the books and it's the way it should be. And then but there is another there is another place for the kind of justice that Reddington dispenses. They are people who are above the law because they're part of the law, because they use the law to do the bad things, like Connolly, like the Cabal, like this guy. I mean, like many, like the the, the guys in, um, in Vanessa Cruz. There have been a lot of these people using, mm-hmm. making, doing things very legally, but at the end, it, the end is objectionable, is morally objectionable. Right. And, you know, they're abusing the system. And they would never would have taken down someone like Tom Connolly through legal matters. I mean, they just couldn't have. Or the cabal. No. And so, I mean, but it's... So, I, I think... I, I've been doing a lot of thinking about this because there is that. I mean, there have been plenty of times that Liz has colored well outside the lines... Everybody that's listened for any amount of time knows I love the characters that play in the gray like this. But the question that I'm trying to figure out in my own head is, what is it about this guy? And I think it is that while I understand that she was offended by what a complete horrible human being he was and the way that he was handling... He was like, callous. Yeah, I mean, he he has, as an individual that creates weapons, he had a responsibility. And while he, he was using, what, he was using the, the his own customers. He was using the people who buy the guns as a as a shield. Yeah, that he was using the real good gun owners as much as he was yes. using the criminals that he sold his guns and the innocent victims to make a profit for himself. He was using he was the just, government to shield himself. He had he no just more. a douche canoe of insane proportions. I mean, he was just horrible. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I the, agree. He was using everybody he could. He just, he was a leech. Yeah, and, and there is a point where, and I agree with Red, Completely, I'm a more, I'm a total moral relativist. I, 
to me, it feels like, you know, you, you want to take these guys out. They could have done it legally. They could have had really good listening equipment in there so they could have catch camp saying, um, you know, yeah, do the sale. I don't care. Who cares? Just sell her all that. How about if you sell them even more or whatever? They could have. They could have. There was a possibility of doing exactly that, created a, a under um, an undercover operation and get him on, on the on the record saying those things. But there was also a red sway, which was cheaper for the for the for the taxpayer. Um, and um, it created kind of a more of a moral deterrent. Um, you're going to be less likely to take that view if you think that a guy like Raymond Reddington, who has no is not leashed by any adherence to the law, take you out yeah. if he considers that you vigilante justice. Yeah. And 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 there is a there is I think what the blacklist is saying sometimes that's the only justice you'll get. Yeah. For the people no, who are that, but- too powerful, too hidden or 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 taking advantage. What I was uh, and I was taking a long way to get there, sorry. Not that we have ever gotten distracted ever in the no. course of our <laughs> no tangents here. Um but the point that I was trying to make is the I am trying to find why it is the her reaction here and the way she handled it here and going I had no problem with her shooting Tom Conley. None whatsoever. I mean, even if she had been 100% with it all in that moment, I wouldn't have had any problem with it. But I think... A nice recording would have taken that out. For me, I... Maybe. It depends on who got a hold of the recording. They didn't know who was in the cabal. Um, But for me, I think it has to do with personal connection. I give... And this, this is an emotional reaction. Um, I give Liz a whole lot more leeway when she w- when it has to do with something personally. When she was tracking, you know, when she goes... The, the task force, her friends, Agnes, Tom, whoever. Exactly. Red. Um, but this was... And Red, I had no problem with him killing this guy at the end. Because for him, it was personal. I actually preferred him going in and doing that rather than dragging the task force in. It felt much more natural for me for Red to go in and do that. For Liz, I felt like there was that separation there that's like, okay, I I understand you feel this way, and I totally, totally get that. But to take that path when she wasn't there, it felt, and I'm not saying anything bad about the writing, I'm just saying my personal emotional reaction to it. I feel like I give her more leeway when it has to do with her family, chosen or, or otherwise, than something like this where it's, you know, degrees of separation. But I think it was more understandable for the point of view or what they're trying to convey that this wasn't. This was just that she has got so comfortable in the vigilante justice. But the problem with the difference that I see between her and Red is that Red has one thing that keeps him on the somewhat straight and narrow within his path which is a loyalty a loyalty to the people that serve him and a need to to stay what with what he considers to be the greater good or whatever work he's doing that our path is doing whether Liz has not such thing Liz will throw the task force her friends um red in jail over Whoever comes with a shiny object, be it a DNA profile or I'm your mother, even when when reason should say, wait a minute, if that's your mother, why don't you know this and this and that? Um, why would you need somebody to take you to Dom if you know that you, after Rasmus should have said, wait a minute, if you gave Dom a key and you know that he would be checking it every week that's probably within driver's distance so why didn't you know where he was she doesn't think like this whenever family whatever that truth about who she is and who her parents are is in front of her she has no moral compass whatsoever and and that is a big difference and that's and i and i'm beginning to consider that liz is will not have any salvation 
because she lacks that. Ren has Ren is more likely to to have a, a job that she's that he's doing that is a somewhat okay justification that Liz is because I think that Liz is has all the moral dubiousness of her mother and and the wide range of actions as as uh, I believe Red is ready in turn of her father. So I think that that the combination is really bad. And I think when Liz lost Tom, she lost the tether to a semblance of control that she had. For some reason, Tom was that kept Liz in a check her darker impulses. And her yeah. darker impulses are a lot darker than Rhett's. Well, I think that Tom and Liz, for each other, they anchored each other. They provided, while well, both of them had very dark tendencies, for the other, the other person was the light. Mm -hmm. And so they were able to help balance each other out. And also, Tom understood with Liz. I mean, I, I think that both of them knew each other so well. That by the time we got to season three and four, there weren't, while there were secrets, like the bones and such, there weren't any secrets. It, it goes down to when Liz had the the passports and everything, when Tom hands them over in season four, says, I told you I threw these out, but I couldn't. And she says, I used to be afraid of these, but I'm not anymore. That, to me, showed a deep connection that without the masks, without the walls, that on a deep personal soul level, they knew each other. And I think that there's something very, very stabilizing about that, that they mm -hmm. weren't, she knew that no matter what she did, Tom was there. I mean, I'm sorry, when you shoot a guy and keep him on a boat for four, four months and then he still comes back, <laughs> yeah. You know, and it's still madly in love with you. Like, she wasn't going to run this man off. <laughs> and so I think that the task force, in a lot of ways, um, for better or for worse, they don't, they see glimpses of it, but they don't know that depth. Because she mm -hmm. doesn't have these conversations. She would go home and talk to Tom about what was going on in her head and, you know, have that board to bounce it off of she mm -hmm. doesn't have that anymore she can't go home to her what four or five year old and do that she can't do it with red because she's playing red she can't do it with the task force because they're not on the same plane as she is yes they work in the gray but they are just not at the same level that she functions at yeah. tom but was a not fantastic even, balance yeah. and on top of being a balance he also wanted something a little more normal. So he pulled her back from the edge a lot. Mm -hmm. I, I also think that the the one that is like, they all have gone now. You got Alina Park, who's definitely on the gray, but but she tries to follow. A uh, wrestler has got a lot more mm -hmm. in the red. And, and I'm suspect that we're red. going to in see him in the, yeah, in the gray, but it's in the red, actually. Uh that, that you could see that he's getting more comfortable with it, but it's yeah. still not his... Yeah. There, it's there's not his that, mode. There's still... While he's doing it, there's stuff that you accept, and there's stuff that you're willing to vocally accept. And so, I mean, if Liz were to go, hey, Ress, let me lay out my darkest impulses, I think his immediate reaction would be like, Holy crap. You yeah, know, it'll be like, while, um, can I request a transfer to Alaska? <laughs> I mean, but while it's piecemeal and things are happening and he sees the reasons behind them, you know, he might be able to accept things that he didn't used to be able to accept. Yeah. And I love seeing them work together and that acceptance grow, but I don't think she has anybody right now that she feels comfortable enough with there's been so much betrayal in this woman's life i don't blame her she just doesn't have that sounding board no plus i think that there is some she even said it to when she was describing um when she was talking to constantine and they were in the water when she took down the plane mm -hmm. i mean i mean think about that she took a plane which she was in it doesn't get crazier than that <laughs> um 
she she said what well, you know what kind of horrible things happened in your childhood with horrible twisted things happened that that uh, made you into a narcissist uh, that you think that by doing horrible things to you you make me you're gonna make me love you i think that that was that's exactly what liz is she knows that she's a narcissist that she knows she did she's always known that she's doing something terrible and, and i have a feeling that deep inside um there is some to it and I, i've said before how i'm slowly pivoting into thinking that I used to blame Red for not telling her and say, if you just told her, it would be so much easier. I don't think that anymore. I think yeah, that... Yeah, I'm always going to think that. <laughs> I don't yeah. see that opinion changing on my end. I I, I got this feeling that it, it, the more we learn, the more we understand that there is a reason for this. I, and and something in the past, I've been, begun to reevaluate that, that the shooting and the fire... And there are things there that we're not seeing. It doesn't. It doesn't quite match like most things in the blacklist. Mm -hmm. And when it doesn't match, it's because we're missing the connecting piece. Yeah. No. I I think that you summoned it perfectly. The blacklister was boring as boring can possibly be. Um, I think there's a reason for that. He, even though the episode is named after him because he's needed for the numbers, the episode really was about. Um, about Liz and about Red and about that that line blurred lines and how far are Cooper and the task force willing to yeah. go? But Cooper was really the star in this one. He just pulled one over Liz and Red. I loved his reaction in their conversation. It's <laughs> I'm sorry. Are you actually angry with me? I I think that Liz needs that sometimes. She gets. Once again, because she doesn't have anybody to bounce it off of, she gets so lost in her own head that, like, I was right, you were wrong. Why would you do this? Why wouldn't you? Wh why would you question do my you, loyalty? Do you, you remember know, Gina like, Sanitakis when she erupts into his office, screaming at yeah. her boss and her superior for because wrestlers shot Gina and saved her from being stabbed? Yeah, and she's like. How could you do that? She had the answers I want. And this is exactly this. Why would people don't do that when this is the answers I want or the people I consider they're bad? Why would you stop me? In, a, in many ways, she is that four-year-old girl who decided that she was going to get a gun and take yeah. matters into her own hands. And that's, ooh, that's interesting. I like that, that thread there. But yeah, it just, I, I think that sometimes she needs... And that, that's why I am glad she's still in the task force because she has people like Cooper and maybe Wrestler. And I wouldn't trust a ROM right now to pull her back from the brink. But, you know, maybe someday again. Um, but to, to kind of go, hang on, refocus, refocus. You don't get to be mad at me. And this is why. And so while they're the not going to see everything. The fact that he had to explain that is pretty like, oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. You don't see the problem here? Well, um, it's it goes back to... You never self-diagnose. Like, when he asked her to, to profile herself in the pilot, I mean, yeah, she hit some stuff, but in the grand scheme of things, people very rarely, even if they're very, you know, very good at self-reflection and understanding their own, you know, where they're coming from and can adjust for that, nobody's perfect on that. And I'd say Liz is probably less than perfect. Because even if she knows that she's doing stuff, it doesn't necessarily adjust. She she doesn't always take the steps she would need to adjust to yeah. fix that. I mean, she really, just leans into it. If you think about it, where Liz really belongs is in Halcyon. Oh yeah, she would. That's where she belongs. Thrive in Halcyon Aegis because she's she has a good moral compass when she wants to. Um, but now, the things that matter to her. Yeah, and and no, I I think that, that would be fantastic. I still say she and bring Scotty are very similar to one another. If I'm mad with you, I'll have somebody beat you up with a bowl. <laughs> yeah. Oh oh. With a cool. sock of balls. I'm sorry. Ouch. Yeah. yeah, he loves that thing. Um. No, but uh, you know, I I still say bring Tom back. Put him, you know, in the background to, to run Grey Matters, have Liz out in the field. I'd be game for that. That'd be a nice ending. 
I think that'd be, I think it would put people exactly where they need to be. And then she can be the liaison between Halcyon and the task force. Mm-hmm. I'm okay but with she that. Doesn't, she doesn't really belong in the FBI. And, and I've been saying that for a while. She just doesn't belong. She doesn't have, the, the other ones are willing to go a little bit and then back, yeah. not, not Liz. I, I think for me, the way I see it is that I'm worried if she, she would have to go someplace where she had a connection, where she still had a connection to the FBI, where she still had people around her that would cur- help her curb her darker impulses. Otherwise, she would go so far down that rabbit hole. Mm-hmm. That you'd never, you would lose. And we've seen Cooper talk about this over the years. He makes the comment in season two when she puts him, when she basically says, well, he'll tell you that I was on that boat for official reasons and puts him on the spot there. And he made similar statements in this episode where he's like, I'm, I'm worried about you. I, yes, I'm angry, but I'm more worried because I'm watching you change and I don't want you to lose that good person that you are. I think that she needs people around her. Red doesn't count. I love Red. Is she a good person? I think she has good tendencies. I mean, I good, bad. They're all in the gray. It's all a little bit iffy. But yeah, but Liz is like on the specter towards the black, and the other ones are towards the white. That's that's exactly what I'm saying. Is that she needs people around her. To be able to help her balance where she can't. Yeah. As yeah. a fan of Liz, I don't want to see her told like Cooper. I don't want to see her lose herself. Change is inevitable. That's fine. Change and growth, it all happens. I don't want her to see her lose herself because in the end, I do believe that Liz wants to do good. She's just her focus is becoming warped in a lot of ways and she needs to find a way to balance it so she doesn't tip over the edge mm-hmm. well i think that the edge she, she tipped over the edge i think way before to I, me I to me she tipped over where the, the edge, edge by sending red to to uh to the death penalty yeah that was rough yeah. <laughs> she, because I think that deep inside, it was the same as when she took the the, the DNA test in, in season two, which, uh, and then threw away because she didn't want to know that the devil was her father. And I think that in that point, she and Jennifer, Jennifer used her to get her revenge and that both girls had a problem with daddy abandoned me and I'm going to punishment. As Red said, the Rostov family are eccentric and extremely violent. Yeah. So, I mean, they don't just tell you that you're wrong. They basically try to kill you. Yeah. And you're wrong. I'll tell you that as I choke you to death. Yeah. I mean, and that's... that's I'll beat you with, a, with a bowl of... Oh, or I have somebody... I have my other son beat you up because you lied to me. Or I'll keep you in a boat and... Yeah. and Exchange information, uh, you know, and then I'll forgive you because I already punish you. The fact that Liz, and I I don't, I'm not saying this is a judgment towards her. I'm just saying that the fact that Liz needs those extremes, which to be fair, finding out your husband has been lying to you, whether he loves you or not, but he's a covert operative and has been using you and going through all that. That's an extreme moment. What? And how so, many people fact, would would take him into a boat and keep him yeah, there? Exactly. And so the fact that she had to react in turn at those same extreme measures says a lot about her at her core. I honestly, she needed that. It was it was the way she moved on. And eventually she did I think it wasn't until season three that she finally chose to trust him. That she knew she loved him before that. She just didn't want strings attached. But when she finally decided to keep Agnes, that was the moment where she was saying, okay, I am accepting that this can and will work and that I am choosing to trust you. Even in your really freaking stupid moves, don't ever go (laughs) ask Gina Santa Tacos for help. (laughs) Um, so that takes us into 
the the really interesting part of the episode. Ilya. <laughs> yes, indeed. So, okay, I have a big question for you. Mm-hmm. And this could just be the paranoia that comes up with the blacklist. <laughs> could um never trust a spouse um how do you feel about linda i am having misgivings with her me too and like i said it may just be is i mean if you take it out of the blacklist this is a perfectly normal response we had a very normal life before you came back in so let's remove you but within the parameters of the blacklist when someone says that they typically have an ulterior motive. She was railroading, and I wasn't even sure that that Ilya was going with her. I, you know, she had a coat on and a and a and a and a piece of luggage, and Ilya was in the sofa with the same shirt, and no idea or not think that she he was leaving. So I, it seemed, you know, and again, it it seemed that they were saying that they were leaving. I'm not sure. I'm also thought that she was totally railroading Ilya. Oh yeah. And I'm not even sure that she knows that she doesn't understand completely the relationship between them because she calls him Frank. So this is post when he was Ilya. I mean, this is this isn't he knows him in that new identity. They don't he she said she doesn't have any idea who he is. And well, she says I, she doesn't know the full extent of Red and Ilya's relationship, but Dimbe and Red were both calling him Ilya around her. They no, never no, referred they to him. You? He hmm. is bad. Okay. Dimbe was I, talking to Red and said Ilya, but she mm-hmm. wasn't in either side. And when Dimbe came in, he called him Ilya. Yes, but she wasn't around. Okay, maybe. It's one of those things like um, like in season two when we have Frank and um, and Naomi and we have this um, uh, and and it seems like she's talking about Jennifer within his hearing, but she isn't. They're yeah. they're in different part of the rooms. They're talking to different people. Um, so that's. I think it's complex. There is something about her that I'm not fully convinced that there is more to her. I'm not sure that we have seen the last of of Ilya. And I also found very interesting, I don't know if you have seen a series, I've done it in both in Reddit and and Tumblr, about the crediting. And it's bizarre. What they're doing with the crediting of the actors is beyond insane. I don't think that that... Are you talking about the credits that they roll on, uh, like, when the show's going? No, because when the show is going, it doesn't say who's playing what. It's it's only the minor characters on the end that have that. But um, Brett Cullen has been credited as The Stranger up until this last episode when he was just credited as... Ill. So are you talking about IMDb? IMDb and Amazon. Yeah, that's... IMDb is not a good place to to weigh in on that. They are Amazon. really iffy. Uh, Amazon's they... not very good either. They they kept calling Samara Mira. Hear <laughs> like, me out. Okay. Hear me out. I understand that, but right. this is different. All right. This is different because you have to see the extent in what they're doing in order to see well well they're not reliable yeah i know but there is a reliable thing that they were doing which is calling brett cohen credited as a stranger and when he was credited as Ilya in this last episode only they just omitted the last name he was Ilya, not Ilya koslov whether gabriel mann is consistently credited as Ilya koslov Katerina Rostova, Lotte Verbeck is, is credited consistently as Katerina Rostova, unless we have the two episodes in which Liz remembers her, and in that case, she's credited as Masha's mom. We have um, the young girls playing Liz, which are different because they couldn't have the same person over so many years, are credited as Liz. Young Liz for 
one uh, from 209 and 210 but as and 222 but as Yom Masha when is um, Requiem and when um, Kate remembers her and, and, and those memories when she remembers herself in the Summer Palace. Uh, we have, um, and Katerina Rost and the blonde Katerina is credited as Katerina Rostova. And the only episode where we saw both of them together, which is a little bit in Orion, Kat Lotte is not credited at all. So this is beyond bizarre. There is a logic to this. And Maybe. Um, I, I, I see the trail you're following down. Um, and I definitely, I, I'll give it more credit than I did a few minutes ago. So sorry about that. I can't get but anybody the, something... that a rabbit hole. <laughs> I got very appealing rabbit holes. Nice Tessa returnish. got so excited the other day. I sent her a text and I said, <laughs> I'm doing my rewatch. And I finally got up to Naomi, Carla Reddington. And yeah, what was it I sent you? I said, something was really bizarre. The, the way that something was phrased. I don't even remember what it was that I said. I said, I'm not saying that I'm on board with Carla Rina. I am just saying that what you have said makes sense in this scene. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I made her day. <laughs> oh my god, yeah. Let me just I me read that because I was I feel like it should preface this because it was it was more funny than that. I feel it should preface this by saying that this not does not mean I'm on board with Carlarina, but on sec on season two of this rewatch, Red calling Carla his wife again and again and again reminds me of how Tom always referred to Liz as his wife, even when they were on the outs. Yeah. That so was yes, it. you went down that rabbit hole, people. It's more than <laughs> I considered. I took a look. I leaned over. I peeked in. <laughs> yeah. And you saw it's an attractively furnished rabbit hole. It was. It was a very interesting moment. Thanks for looking that up. It's. I just. I kept hearing him say, it and I went, "Hang on," <laughs> because Tom did that. It was all through season three. When, when he was threatening and you're gonna be yeah. my wife, you you um you frame my wife and you're gonna come and be my wife, and then it's like my wife, my ex-wife. Yeah, the same thing that Red was doing. Yep. And I like, always say it's like and, and people say, Oh, that is like bad writing. No, oh. it isn't. It's it meant, isn't. It's, it's meant to be something. And so it was it was very interesting. Uh, so yes, Tessa Tessa has very interesting rabbit holes. I'm not always on board with them, but you know, once she explains them, I'm like, all right, okay, I see your logic. <laughs> I mean yeah, that well, <laughs> And if you were following the, the, the plan, how about that last scene when um when Red is talking with Liz and he's all happy and suddenly, uh, Demet tells him, yeah, it was Liz. Liz knows that you're not Ilya, and uh, she's keeping that from you. And they have that fantastic take where they show Liz double-faced. And then they show her by two candles. I, this is a double-faced woman, and she's perfectly capable of keeping secrets from people. Yeah. I mean, if you don't believe in the symbols, that shot where Liz was shown like a two face, that should that should send anybody who's really interested into rewatching for those symbols, the ways they use the mirrors, the ways they use water, the ways they use fire and plaid. It's and even musical instruments if you're into it. They're they're there. The camera angles, the way they shoot things. For example, when Liz got, you remember that shot? That was so bizarre. When Liz, after 2.10, when she's on on her bed and in the motel, mm -hmm. and she reaches and she finds the fulcrum, and they have her, they film it through a, through a seam in a mirror, and she looks like her face is like distorted. Like, like there is like two sides of her that don't quite match. Yeah, there's a really interesting scene in the Tom Keen episode that I've never quite figured out why they shot it this way, but it's such a bizarre shot. There has to be a reason. It's, it's, yeah, it's, 
you guys can't see her, but Tessa's doing hand movements. And <laughs> but it's he's sitting there talking. Tom's sitting there talking to to din- uh, dinner. 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 Yeah. Um, and we get a shot through. It's not even a mirror. It's just some sort of reflective surface. But it's just so bizarre how it's shot. And I still, I mean, I still don't know exactly why it was. But I mean, when they're that far, that odd. You know, then there's a reason for it. Mm -hmm. Well, there is a shot of Liz talking with Judge Denner in which they shot her in a in a convex mirror and you see her upside down. And they use a very similar shot for Leonard Cole when he's Mm -hmm. talking to to Dembe on the streets and he's seeing him and, you know, he had the two fingers that are not there. It's the whole thing is. Yeah, it's a phenomenal um phenomenal way in which they use they they had a, a, a scene that was shot through a revolving door in season in se- I think it was 201 they use parallels uh, for example they're you're getting two people hunting two Reddingtons um, Samari is hunting Reddington and Lord Baltimore is, is hunting Mrs. Reddington um, and they make you they confuse you with that the the mirrors even in that that last scene in which red is under in the in the in the pilot when red is under the seal of the fbi sitting at the at the position of power in the table the seal is reflected on the on the table and it looks like a river that goes through the table uh and the other ones and there's these two fbi agents but they're not looking like they're like they're there to make sure that red doesn't hurt anybody they look like they're protecting him you know, do, do you go through that entire thing, what he does with that seal? He's in front of the building. He has a flag on his back. He then le- uh, kneels on top of the seal and he ends up under the seal. Then when Liz die is wrestler jacket with the seal of the FBI around his shoulder. There is a lot of, of, of camera work of symbols in here. I mean, if you if you track, for example, the people who are seen with musical instruments, they all have had a loss. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're dead, but the person is not there, or they think they're dead, or they can't see them again. It's it's so phenomenal, and and that that whole that whole scene with Red and Liz was so. Incredible. First, they're discussing Cooper. Cooper, Cooper, um, trick, trick both of them, and it's very different their reaction because Liz is like pissed, and Brad is yeah. like, "Yep, yeah, that was a good one." <laughs> yeah. Oh well. Um. There's that scene. I'm trying to remember what episode it was, but when when the guy that supposedly taught Red everything he knows, you know, tricked yes, him, right. and Red's just like, "All right." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a kind good of one, one. Of those, he he can respect a well played hand, mm-hmm. you know. And th- there's a sense of res- a sense of respect uh, in, in someone that's that gets one over on him because it is difficult. Yeah, well, it's it's like when Scotty does it by creating that that distraction with Solomon and the nuclear weapon and this whole ring marole, uh, complete with like the FBI and the whole thing. And then all that it was is just to get him away so that they could get Liz. The whole thing. I mean, it's, it, that was such a great moment because now red is in a very interesting relationship with both red, with both Cooper and Liz. Uh, do you have anything else? No, not really. Um, I'm trying to think for Ilya. Let me see. Yeah, like all I had for Ilya really was that I don't trust his wife because what we saw with him was a man that's been seriously scarred by this. You know, he's obviously having some mental issues, some flashbacks, severe PTSD. Most traumatic stress disorder. Exactly. Um, But, and so we're... You know, you think during the majority of the episode that that's what's going on, that, you know, he's imagining things and this and that. And his wife is very much pushing that narrative that he's imagining it. And but then at the end, we see that he wasn't. While it wasn't Katarina, you know, blonde cat, it was at least it was the the um, 
PI that Liz hired. I would. I mean, if I'd been the wife, I would have been watching with him and Same. maybe seeing like you just like I'm gonna dog a wig and see if I can see what it is or at least get the plate. Exactly. I mean, I. I was kind of surprised to hear Linda say that she knew exactly what happened to him. Because if it just depends. If she comes from a normal background, and this all feeds into why I don't trust her. If she comes from a normal background, yet was told what happened to him, I'm right there with you. I would have been at the window with him going, okay, you see it? All right, let me see. And I'll go get the plate. I'll go take a picture of the guy. Exactly. Let's let's get some help. We're out of our deaths here. And yet she's going, nah, nothing's there. Nothing's there. I know exactly what happened, but obviously this is Red's fault and he just needs to go. And so there's just a lot of that that really felt off with her. Um, and Red seeing in the end, because, I mean, he thought, okay you know he's just he finally broke there's something you know he, he's seeing things that aren't there he's just he needs a break from this he needs to get away and then he sees the little blue car and he goes good job Ilya," or whatever he said you know um in the he really was seeing something there so the entire reason that we should supposedly trust linda there that something's off and that Ilya's not catching on to things that got negated the moment that red saw that car mm -hmm. and so i just don't trust her and i i find interesting that when as red is coming and saying you know i i knew that you were um you weren't you weren't imagining things that the that's the moment where we see uh, linda with his, her coat in a bag while Ilya is just sitting in the sofa in his shirt saying you know I'm, i'll go uh, we'll go uh somewhere far but the way they phrase the things red asked where you'll go we don't know if it's you is her or her and Ilya, and she answers somewhere far not i'll go somewhere far or we'll go somewhere far so we are left not really understanding if she's going alone because she just heard that he wasn't crazy that there was a person there looking at him yeah. And then the normal reaction is not saying that. The normal reaction would be, okay, can we get new identities and go? Can we get something? I have a feeling that, that Ilya was a guy who was always doing identities for Red. I don't think that he has been that out of it. There's, yeah, otherwise, why, why, why would Red bring him back in? I mean, so he's had to have had a connection with him. We know they've been close over the years, like brothers. It's He's not the kind, he never seemed, you know, other than Ross, but, but you know, Dom was a particularly good um, tail weaver. Um, we haven't really seen Ilya be, doing nothing, but, you know, was he at a desk? Uh, he didn't seem to have been like an operative. Uh, in that sense, I mean, he could shoot, but that goes uh, along with the life. But he didn't seem to be. Um, th there's a very strange shot when we have, you know, when we get Frankie and she's leaving the first time after Dom gets shot, and and Demi gives her a card of this guy says that he gives, you know, he takes care of you, gives you a new identity or whatever. Um, and they highlight that, that name, that card. And I always thought, that's so weird. I wonder if that is what Ilya does. And he can track people and he can uh, get new identities. And that's maybe that's why he can track this woman, because he gave her at some point some identity. Or he knows mm -hmm. how to track people. But it doesn't seem to me that, that um, he had really been that out of it that retire maybe retire in the sense of he abandoned the castle of identity that much is obvious because everybody thinks he's a ghost he can't be found and he had this identity frank bloom but i don't know that first what is her game how much does she know and is she really living alone or with him yeah i agree i you know, and it could be semi-retirement that on a grand scale, he's not doing this for a bunch of people. But when certain friends and, you know, long time, you know, folks that he's known come to him and say, hey, can you do this for me? He still has the connections there to get it done. Um, but yeah, I, I did not trust Linda. She and that may just be my 
I've been with the Blacklist for seven seasons, and I've learned. Now I'm distrusting. Trusting. Before we were distrusting redheads. Now I'm distrusting blondes. Right? <laughs> yeah. I'm distrusting blondes. Whenever we see a blonde woman, I'm like, hmm. Yeah, this is, this is, the, it's, it's getting, I mean, some people are upset to me. This is, it's, it's all working out very well. The clues seem to be, for me, the clues are aligning very nicely. Um, every episode, I'm getting a little piece here and there. They may not be obvious clues, but they're there. There to me, they're there, and I think that uh, even the episode was a tough one um, with hot button issues. Uh, perhaps the blacklister could have been a bit more nuanced, but maybe the point was not to make it nuanced. It's not to make it. This is not about the the guys who make real stuff, and they're you know they're they're bright. This guy was all for making a buck using whoever he had to use, the gun people, the anti-gun people, the, whatever it is, to ramp up my my and make a buck. He obviously had no morals whatsoever. This is, you know, this is no this is no pro who had, you know, he had some things and then he was advancing some and had some issues. This is a whole different story. This is a guy whose only object here was making a buck. He didn't care who was killed. Yeah, but it's still like the whole setup felt very much like Pearl with, with basically yeah, that, that conversation in the way that this you know it, it was like a highlight of this is how Red handles it. This is how he functions. Trying to do it through the task force with this situation was not going to work. It never he should not have gone that route to begin with. This was where he was always going to end up, and it would have been a whole lot easier for him. Granted, we wouldn't have had a story, but. In his world, it would have been a lot easier for him just to have tracked this guy down and gone, we're done, bye. Yeah, I'm taking your guns and I'm killing you. Yep. Um, I think it is to show us that, that there is going to always be a need for what Red does. And I think that Red tried to make it more legal, and that is where he rubber bands back into, there is a place in the world for what I do. And I assume that my soul may get diminished every time I kill someone, but I'm, the people I'm killing are scums of the earth. And I'm protecting the innocent by doing this, which is something that Dembe had addressed when he was talking with Imam in season five. You know, we used to, I used to think that what we were doing was protecting the innocents. Now I'm not so sure we're doing that. So this has always been that thing. We're going back and forth in the last two seasons. So we're protecting the innocents, not protecting the innocents. Um, uh, what is that we're doing? What is this, this work we're doing that Denbe, who is a de deeply moral person, feels that is justified to do what he does? Yeah. No, I, I do think, I definitely feel like after a second round with this episode, I found a lot more threads to follow. And, you know, it's... It was interesting. Um, I don't necessarily like all the threads, but we'll see in the the whole of the story how it fits in there. I do feel like it was moving it forward, even even if you know, mm -hmm. I, yeah. It could have been made a bit more interesting, yes, probably. But I think in in the whole arc of the story, it moved it pretty good. Yeah, it made yeah, the points right. that it made that it needed to make. And I think that sometimes with a blacklist that's brilliantly is the same thing that Red does in in that how he does his charades and how everybody does charades. You have to trick people in emo people's emotions in order to blind them in order to create your charade. If you're not creating the emotional part, you're not hooking the person. Right. And sometimes I think that by using hot buttons, and we know that Tom Keene is one of those hot buttons, um, you know, all these political things are hot buttons, they make us look the other way, is look at the shiny hand, while the other one is actually doing the stuff. Yeah, they, they have done that for a long time. We're going to yeah. talk about dad, we're going to talk about dad, we're going to talk about dad, oh look mom. Yeah, that was something else. Yep. So that's all I got. Yep, that's about wraps it up. All right, guys, you can reach out to us and chat with us on Twitter, Facebook, and Tumblr, and Tessa's over on Reddit. And you can listen to us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and YouTube. 
And next week, we will have our 100th episode. Oh, my God. Can you believe that? How crazy I'm is just, that? I'm still trying to convince the other gen to do a theory-only episode. Um, it would be great. Um, I'm sure that between the two of us can pull Jen a little, the other this gen, into a bit more to take a peek in a rabbit hole. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, it's a toss. We'll see. And we are definitely going to, uh, at the end of the episode, let's see what brings, because we have the season cut short, but they're cobbling together an episode, which has me insanely excited, because the fact that they're cobbling it together means that they're using past um, footage that they've been keeping. So I bet they're going to use some of their secret footage that is the, the ending to cobble a story together. So I'm I don't. hoping... That's, it's going to be interesting, and we definitely live in a very strange world right now, but for for this, I'm glad that they're able to take that, and it'll be fascinating to see how they approach that creatively, mm-hmm. and I mean, because they weren't able to finish shooting the episode that was that was planned, yeah. so I, I don't know, I will, I am very interested in that and I'm also very interested uh, it's not next week it's the following week we have brothers which yeah. is the wrestler arc episode I'm super interested in that one and, and I don't think that we can finish by another thing that saddened all of us which was the loss of Brian Dennehy. Um, yes. it, it was a I felt I felt a sadness that it felt like i lost somebody that i known for such a long time. I've been a fan of Mr. Dennehy for so long. I've I had the privilege of seeing him in a few um, stages and it was he was a terrific actor in the movies as well as in stages. In stages he was really impressive. Um, and I, it would be interesting how they handled that um, that story creatively uh, while still paying tribute to, I thought it was a very nice mm-hmm. gesture to show Rasvet um, after this episode. But uh, we're yeah. very saddened, I think, by, by that loss and, you know, condolences to his family and to his fans, yes. which become a yep. sort of family. Yep. It's definitely a loss. Um, and I, I do wonder if maybe the reason that they've had Dom off off camera and in a coma is because he was ill or something. I mean, it was... I, I don't think so. He was he was scheduled to begin shooting of a... He had two oh. films in post-production, and he was scheduled to begin shooting... I think it was in, in a few months he was beginning uh, uh, scheduled to begin shooting of another series or another oh. movie yeah no well, I, I think it was just you know pot luck well yeah as much as it can be pot luck when somebody that when an actor playing such a significant role can die and a beloved actor can die but i think it was just they i mean just like when um uh megan got pregnant it was pot luck that they had filmed that scene with tom otherwise i guess it would have been a back uh, a backflash but yeah I, I think it may have been it was just just what happened very All sad right. very um and so be interesting to see how they handle that but we will talk to you guys next week All until right. then stay well be safe don't go Bye-bye. crazy yeah we watch. <laughs> try, try to keep your sanity <laughs> <laughs> alright bye-bye. bye bye